So we're going to talk. Hi, everybody. Hi. We're going to talk today about birth and especially this idea of birth and rebirth in the springtime. I want to talk about this, uh, this ritual from the Jewish tradition that really, I think, honors what I see as totally true in this situation, which is when, uh, when somebody has given birth, uh, after that ritual, there's a, there's a time when the, the, the woman goes to the Torah, goes to, comes to the synagogue and says a special prayer to, uh, to honor and acknowledge the danger, the dangerous passageway in which that she and that child passed through in order for there to be new life, which is if you've had a kid, you've thought about this, you know that the, that moment is so full and uh, not just of emotion and of, and of expectation, but also of danger, real danger and danger of death. You know, danger of death. I, it's interesting to me that the tradition honors that, but I, then I see that on the Jewish side of things I'm a rabbi. And then I see on the Buddhist side of things, my Zen teacher, Brian Arnell, who says, who would teach on in this, he would say, he would use the word for it to describe the process of birth as like a vortex, which is such an interesting, like turbulent almost experience. And, and you could imagine if you're thinking about yourself as a child coming into the world, what it would be, feel like a vortex, just like that, in terms of that moment of being so warm and, and calm and nurtured with, and, and to then go through this process of being squeezed and pushed and, and, and then you have to breathe, right? And, uh, and it's like, it's cold, right? And, and all of a sudden, it's a whole new thing. You got to eat for yourself. You got to, you know, go for yourself. You got to do all these things that mama was doing for you until that moment, right? And I want to tell a story that I've never told before. This is apropos uh, of just, you know, part of the process of how this all starts to unfold, which is a story about birth and how it caused a real strong um, uh, suffering in the world in, in, in a relationship that I had a years ago. And I remember we were sitting and we talking and holding hands and, uh, just embracing each other and hearing each other and seeing each other and loving each other's essence to, in a way that I don't remember quite ever feeling until that point in my life of being held just so completely, so aligned, so sweet with each other. And we uh, were struggling with this uh, issue, uh, which was that, that we had come together a, a month earlier. Um, and the first 10 days of that were spent in silence on a retreat. And we didn't know each other's names even. We had seen each other across the room in a meditation hall of, I don't know, you know 60 people and spent 10 days, seven or 10 days in silence and then met each other and broke in our silence and, and got to know each other. And it was a, like a fusing of souls that I think happened in that process. That's the best way I can honor what happened there. And uh, she had in her mind, uh, at the time I was wearing a different kind of style of kippah. I don't know if you can even see it, but uh, I was wearing one of these. I was wearing one of these big ones um, because I was working on an ambulance in uh, Jerusalem. And so I was wearing, the, and um, in Jerusalem, it's really windy all the time. It's windy all the time. So. Um, I'm a bald guy. It's not, be, it's not just because it's a statement of, well, there's a good reason for why I do it all the way bald, but I was, you know, I'm not trying to pretend that I have more hair than I do. And since I was, since this was a long time ago, what started happening was a practical thing. I couldn't find a clip. Sometimes people clip these onto your, to the hair and no clipping was gonna do like uh, to this hair. <laughs> 
Well, I was going to keep that thing on my head. And I wanted both my hands, you know, and I didn't want to be able to use as an, on an ambulance as a first responder. So I was wearing one of these. Very practical. I looked for it in, in you know, I was like, how do I find one of those that won't fly off my head when it's windy uh, while I'm trying to work? And so I was wearing one of these. And um, what I didn't know at the time, um, and she must have known, is that this is a symbol of a settler, a Jewish Israeli settler in some way, like, um, it, you know, maybe just kind of a person who would go and live in the settlements in Israel. And so she had painted this whole story inside of her head, birthed the whole story a month earlier when she first saw me, that this is a guy who I could settle down with in Israel as a settler. And this is like, you know, the culmination moment was this moment I was just, just describing. But I, what she came to find out was that I, in my head, had started to paint a picture, birthed the story a month earlier, that I, this was a partner for me who would come back to the States, who would come to rabbinic school with me, who would uh, want to be staying in the States and serving in the United States. Um, and when I, when we got to this moment a month later, and we had already laid down so many roots of that relationship, you could see how that would come undone uh, in, in a very painful way for both of us because uh, we both had different ways of birthing a story in which we didn't know each other at all. I'm telling you, we didn't even know each other's names in those first seven days. We didn't know a thing about the other person, what their voice sounds like. We were in silence and we had each created a story assuming what the other person was based on some cues that we had found and then ended up in a really painful breakup and tears and real heartache and sadness because that was a really special uh, moment and time and connection that couldn't exist further than that in time because of, of we were just not going in the same direction at all. And that's what happens when we assume. The mind wants answers, it wants certainty. And so when we were sitting there in silence, we created certainty about what each other were and could be, not knowing, and not even knowing that we were making these stories up. And what happens when that we do that, we get stuck in a vortex of birth in our mind. And that led to eventually the death of that relationship because we held so strongly to the idea we had formed that it needed to die because it wasn't real, right? We created it in our mind. We held it in our mind. We identified with it. We strengthened down. We even connected with each other. And then because it was artificial on both sides without ever asking the question of what are the assumptions here, we ended up in a really painful death of the relationship and of those those ideas so that's that's what happens in in death and um and that's what happens in birth is that we have this opportunity where, where we can learn to how to do deal with this and not get stuck in that trap and that's what i'm teaching it is because i don't want to go down those kinds of depths and I, i've learned a lot from that relationship in terms of what i'm assuming so, and so I don't want to give you just the problem. I want to give you also a solution, hopefully. So uh, here's the solution. So the solution is, number one, you, you just have to pay attention. There's no shortcut. You got to pay attention. You got to know that this pattern exists, that we want to know, and that we will do, you know, a shortcut of trying to know what can't be known. We will try to solidify that. We will try to birth that into consciousness. Number two, back to curiosity. Start surfacing your assumptions and start asking the question of, how do I know that? You know, how do I know that? <laughs> Can, could I know that, right? Had I asked myself the question on day one that, or three or whenever it was that I fell in love with this girl on that Vipassana romance, like, how do I know that? Do I know anything about this person? Do I even know her name, right? Do I know what her voice sounds like or, or her aspirations are or anything substantial? 
beyond what she looks like. So how do I know, right? So had I been able to catch that, all those, you know, that month, the month prior, maybe we wouldn't have suffered so much. Same, same for her as well. And then I think this, the, the, sec, the third piece that I want to give you is then, that, then you got to learn. And I think this has been my, my deeper journey. You have to learn the patterns and the process that leads to that so that you can know, because what I described is the surface. Birth and death and rebirth is the surface. That's what we can detect. But the reality that I've learned through my own practice and through learning with, through the, the steps of the mind is that actually of the 12 steps of the process, there's 12 steps, right? Birth and death are only number 11 and 12. So in the steps of how we get to birth and death, there's 10 steps before you get to birth, which is 11 and death, which is 12. So I just want to emphasize that, that it looks like birth and death. And the truth is that underneath that surface is, is the rest of that, of that glacier, right? The rest of that. So we know the past, we don't know the future, and we're trying to stay as much as possible with curiosity and excitement, and maybe even dealing with the fear of what's happening now. And this is the tool for that. So let's open up now. I'm, I want to curious what that brings up for y'all. Um, and I have some questions to follow. You know, where I am right now with that story is I'm thinking of um, sort of the inherent conflict, right? That the, of human nature where it's like, you think of spring and the Renaissance and the birds and the bees and romance and nobody really wants to think of that logically. Right? Nobody wants to bring in anything that prevents them from making those assumptions. They just want to be swept away. And so that's tricky, like how to balance letting, letting the, the mysterious you know, forces at play that, that magnify, right? Like two people just feel the urge to come together, um, balancing that with, but hang on, Hang on, you know, what's the real story here? What's possible? So that comes up for me. And then along with just, if we were able to, to balance that, how much suffering, as you said, could be avoided. I can think of so many stories, you know, of, of friends who, if only everyone had just been upfront to begin with about what relationship looks like to them, they would have said, oh, oh, you're not as cute to me anymore because that doesn't work, right? So. Right. And I'm curious, thank you so much for sharing that. In terms of relationships, I think it's a big deal. And I'm curious in terms of the therapeutic context, like how do you help others learn to recognize the difference, right, between, between what is really known and what is actually uh, in reality and what is just my past conditioning or desires for a future kind of a thing, because I think that's where we get in trouble. You had an answer, Rodney? Sure. I mean, you know, in, in Jungian terms, we would call this projection. And it's a lifelong, very, uh, uh, well, it's a painful birth process of realizing what is me and what is the other. And, uh, you know, sort of a, a little bit like what Lila Scott was saying, uh, what was striking me so much is like we talk about rebirth and, and transformation and such idealized romantic and glowing terms, think about the actual birth process. Think about what that is really, really, really like. And so, so we're asking for the results of that, but yet avoiding the process of it. And often the process of avoiding, of you know, coming to terms with that person isn't who I thought they were, or I'm not who I thought I was, uh, is part of that really painful, uh, labor process. And, um, th and I'm really intrigued by the, by the idea of the 12 steps that, that, uh, you know, we, we see this, this death, uh, rebirth thing, 
but everything that even leads to that possibility, um, you know, and from a therapeutic point of view, I, I can't help but think that so many of our addictions, no matter what they are, just come from a place of numbing and wanting to avoid the discomfort and, and difficulty of facing all those steps that actually do lead to the, to the rebirth. Uh, yeah, it, Ariel, as you were talking, I kept thinking about Shakespeare. I mean, Shakespeare took this on, you know, forbidden love. Like, what happens when somebody steps in and says, you guys are wrong for each other? Like, it, it doesn't go, <laughs> it tends not to go well. So yeah, you're we actually talking, friend, about, right? I, yeah, I like the question about therapy, because this is kind of a core conflict, you know, that, that different traditions in therapy answer in different ways, which is like, if you see, if you can see the, the devastation coming, Right? Like, do you intervene? And if your worldview is that suffering brings birth and suffering brings wisdom and suffering brings generativity, who am I to obstruct somebody's path? And so we don't know. I mean, you know, I know for a fact uh, difficult relationships in my life have brought about an enormous amount of consciousness. And I'm a wiser person because of it. And it was really difficult to go through. And so th there, I think one of the things there, th ther the therapy in, in is caring. That's the term means to care for, to make whole. And so you're 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 little by little, systematically uh, attempting to contextualize and help. Again, I, back to the talk that I just gave. There's this kind of representation of a mythic worldview that's saying like, where do you fit in this process? And maybe ask yourself the question: What myth are you living out? Is this Romeo and Juliet? Is this uh, you know, who, who is it that's constellating here? And, and that's, I think that's one of the most powerful realities is that there are only so many stories we can tell, right? And so which one are you living is a question to say, how can you reflect on that? Leila Scott, I see you're, I don't wanna keep, keep going. Yeah, I hope I can just get it focused because <laughs> I'm sort of having an aha moment at the same time. It's like, you know, with each relationship, it feels like this opportunity to reenact meeting our own parents in a way. You know, it's like, oh, I thought you were going to be a different way. And then you have to have the pain of realizing, oh, you're this way. And then, you know, maybe you have to break up with your parents or maybe you figure it out. Um, but with each relationship, it presenting ways to individuate. Um, ironically, right? Because That's it's right. really talking about coupling, but in a way it's really about moving more and more into your own truth. Um, and there was a second piece that escapes me at the moment, but it comes back. Ar Ariel, I also like the, um, what you were talking about, the idea, the, uh, the, like the idea of how we, what we think somebody is. You know, like what Lilo Scott's kind of riffing on, you know, that we we kind of create. And this is there's an old uh, rabbi who says the God of the horses is a horse. And I've always loved this quote. You know, it's like our our early stages of relationship, what, what are called oftentimes in, um, infatuation, are beautiful and exciting and rich. And like, I mean, oh, my gosh, it's like transcendent and intense. And, and it's also this kind of savior complex that we're somewhat projecting onto another human being. And there is a death and rebirth in that, you know, like what, what Robert Johnson talks about in, in We, the psychology of romantic love. He says, he, he calls love stir the oatmeal kind of love. That's what we need. What we need is like stir the oatmeal kind of love. My, my wife the other day, this one right here, this just below me, she, she the, my, the most beautiful moment was that Leela Scott walked by my office door and I, the door was open and she had this nice little sweet look on her face and she just put her lips out there and we just kissed for a second and it wasn't anything big. And then we went back to our office and I was like, that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. I love those moments of like meaningful, just mundane connection. They're not the height. Right? Right. Yeah. It's because of the, it's born of the alignment that you two have worked towards. Totally. totally. Yeah. <laughs> end so of the end of surfacing right at the end of surfacing what each of you bring as birth notions through your process so that you can 
put them to death together, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, uh, uh, compassionately together and move forward into the reality that each of you is forming and continually reforming. And, you know, there's no, uh, and uh, each of you come with your own, you know, birth stories that you, that there's an opportunity to move forward through. Yeah, like what, what they say in relationship stuff is that when there when there's a fight, when you're a couple is in a fight, you're both in a complex. But when one person's in a complex and the other person's not, you're in compassion. You know, because if 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 I'm aware of something going on with my partner and I know where it comes from and I can see it, then I'm able to approach her with compassion and she to me. Um, but when we're both triggered, you know, what we call triggered or in a complex, that's that's one of those big fights that's inactive, you know, that kind of mythic enactment of like, wow, that's really powerful. Leila Scott, you were going to say something? Else? Yeah, I was going to say like, similar to how we talked about in your segment about ignoring death and not practicing it. We do a similar thing with love and romance and relationship is we we just want the result of the work and we want to pretend mm -hmm. like that birthing process that being squeezed through the birth canal, the, the pain of birth, like that, that doesn't I don't want need that. to be part of it, you know? <laughs> so yeah, just bringing online, just a, rea a reality check and awareness, not in an uh, annoying pragmatic way that's not magical, but just to tune in instead of tune out that this is going to be effortful. The whole love is a verb thing, you know, for yourself and for your other. So should we come in for a landing? Yeah, Andrew? close us out, Ariel. So the opportunity here is to uh, bring to consciousness the unconscious um, assumptions and ideas that are causing your suffering. So that you can, that what has already been birthed that is keeping you in a vortex of pain and confusion can be resolved by moving uh, surfacing it with curiosity and with compassion and being able to then get a hold of what reality is and if you want to not get stuck in that pattern again and again and again and again then going to learn what is th that's the tip of the iceberg and and then uh you know how do we how do we get down to the to the bottom layers where the other first 10 steps of 12 11 being birth 12 being death um, how do we get to those one through 10 so that we don't, can we, we can short circuit that process before it becomes real and unwanted suffering for everybody around, including ourselves. Thanks, man.